We're back on the road this April with our live show, Cocaine Cowboys. If you want to hear the story of Ireland's love affair with Colombian powder and those who made millions in the gold rush, limited availability remains in Belfast at ulsterhall.co.uk. That's ulsterhall.co.uk. So this time last year, uh, Jerry the Monk Hutch walked out the front door of the the CCJ building um, and it was an incredible moment. I even uh, managed to get myself on uh, photographs all over the world as I was part of the jackals to greet him as he walked out the door. But he walked out and straight away there were stories about what was going to happen to him next, including fears for his his safety or going to be arrested as part of further operations. But you've been looking into how the the year, a year of freedom has gone for the monk. Mm. I suppose I've been trying to, you know, piece together a little bit from people who might know him and who might chat to him about what it was like in the run up to that day and in the aftermath. Um, You know, Jerry Hutch has been asked for interviews by many people, including myself. I'm not sure he's ever going to sit down and do an interview for a number of reasons. Probably, you know, first and foremost, because he probably couldn't speak too freely yeah. for fear of it coming back to bite him in yeah. a way. You know what I mean? I think he's had a few little interactions with the media over the years, but... um yeah, I mean, he did an interview with RT at the time, but I suppose you get to this point where you're going to ask him about crimes and he's going yeah. to have to deny everything. So maybe it's ultimately a frustrating... Yeah, probably a frustrating process for both sides yeah. in a way, you know what I mean? And given what happened to him, I'm sure he doesn't particularly want to be back in the dock again. No, no. You know, I mean, jeopardy, like, but... Um, like this time last year... Do you think he, from what you've, the people you've been talking to, he was expecting to walk out the courts this day last year? Well, I think he would tell friends that he knew he should. Yeah. Because he had, he felt there was no case against him. Um, look, we sat and heard Jonathan Dowdall's evidence and he did too. Um, he had read those transcripts before it ever went to court. And I think his feeling was that there was nothing in them that was going to incriminate him. Um, As regards the charge, which he was, there was one charge put to him, which was murder and nothing else. So I think I always found it interesting, you know, how he got on in the run up to that day, because you could feel the pressure. You could, I mean. He was, so Jerry Hutch was 60, I think, a few weeks or, yeah, even maybe 10 days before the verdict or a week before the verdict. Yeah. And he celebrated that birthday in prison. Yeah. Where he was had been on remand for, was it 18 months? Something like that, yeah. He had been arrested in Spain and extradited back to Ireland on this murder charge. Um, he's not a guy that has been in prison much since he was a younger man. Um, and I did wonder how he'd kind of got on and how he'd coped with it. And I think he was very... Um, determined that he, you know, was going to face down, put up a good defence on this charge. I suppose a lot of that year was caught up in meeting with his legal team, putting together the defence. And obviously then at the last hour when Jonathan Dowdall um, went state witness, they would have had to scramble again and work out what was going to happen there. Because, I mean, of course, it happened very, very late, didn't it? I mean, mm. it was it was sort of unprecedented that the fact that Jonathan Dowdle was going to be a state's witness was only just made known just as the trial was about to start. I mean, Jerry Hutch had been kept, normally when prisoners are on remand awaiting trial, they're kept in either uh, Clover Hill, one of those remand prisons. But Jerry Hutch, of course, was in Wheatfield in mm-hmm. Dublin for all of that time. Um, but he would have been allowed extra visits with lawyers and all of that, presumably. Sharing a wing with Jonathan Dowdall. Yes. A couple of cells up from him, you know. Yeah, yeah. So a very bizarre situation. And I think he sort of has said to people he knows that he kind of knew it was coming with Dowdall. Yeah. Um, I think Hutch is somebody who isn't a drug taker. Like, yeah. he just isn't a drug taker. So, he was in prison, he was a little bit 
of a lone figure because yeah. a lot of the other people he was sharing the prison with were taking drugs and they were kind of, I suppose, off their heads a lot of the time, whereas he wasn't. Yeah. So he tried to keep himself as active as possible and he would have been maybe given an extra little bit of time in the exercise yard on his own because nobody else really yeah. wanted to be out there. Yeah. They were all in their cells. So... It must have been a strange place for him. I think he read and he did as much as he could to keep himself occupied. And of course, there was this huge thing waiting for him, which was the, the Regency trial. Yeah. Um. So the trial gets going and obviously that keeps you occupied if you're a prisoner. Yeah. You're being transported up and down every day. Yeah. Um. Which is, there's that, and there was elaborate security around his movements as well. It would yeah. have even, it would have been even more, probably uh, taken more time and more. So there would have been a full day then during those court hearings, presumably. Yeah, and obviously you're listening intently if you're the guy in the dock facing the murder charge. And the big looming thing was Christmas. Was it going yeah. to finish before Christmas? And of course it didn't because it was a 52-day trial. So it went on past the Christmas. And that, you know, you would have expected was something that was a lonely time yeah. I suppose in, in in prison over Christmas sort of a, fa a family man like him and but I think that he, he has said to friends that on reflection he felt it was good to get a bit of time for everybody to get a bit of time out from it it was so yeah. intense that the break over Christmas was a good thing and then it came back of course and it finished up around the end of January the trial Um it was 140 witnesses, 10 hours of the secret audio recordings, eight days of Jonathan Dowdall on the stand, the phone call data, the hours of the CCTV footage, 27 National Surveillance Unit officers and um, four closing speeches, like an enormity. Yeah. And at that point at the end of January, there was a date given for the 17th of April for the verdict. Yeah, I mean, and normally, of course, it's totally different than a normal jury murder trial because a, a jury murder trial, as soon as all the, the closing speeches end, you're really, a jury is going to come back in f three to four days maximum. Mm. I mean, I don't think they go on really past four or five days ever in the history of the state and they just come back with a verdict, guilty or not guilty. But this is different because it's the special criminal court. So, you know, they have that delay, which is unusual really. I mean, it's normal in the special criminal court, but it's otherwise it's unusual because the judges don't come back and just say guilty or not guilty. They come back with guilty or not guilty and here is why with a big long document, which did come back. Yes, on the 17th of April. Yeah. So the day before that, um, I always felt that must have been, I mean, the pressure yeah. of that. So if you consider that here's a man who has, look, he's known as a criminal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's known, he was described in the court as the head of the Hutch Organised yeah. Crime Group, as the sort of paternal yeah. uh, father figure of the family and all the rest of it. But he's a man who's reached 60 with very little jail time yeah. and with a very uh, sort of interesting life that many of us don't know a huge amount about. But he's also a family man and he's looking down the barrel of 25 years at least in yeah, prison. 100%. If, if convicted. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly never getting out till probably he's 80 years old, except for given medical circumstances that might get him out earlier. Yeah. Like, but really, the end of his, his, like, the end of his life. The end of his life. Like, yeah. So that must be a huge amount of pressure for anybody. But he would say to friends now that he sort of tried his best to keep positive, that he was very nervous. He had this crazy beard and crazy yeah. hair and he was asked if he wanted to have that, you know, tamed, I suppose, yeah. or cut in prison for the verdict. And um, he said that, you know, he felt, what was the point at that stage? Yeah. The, the judges had made their decision and his haircut wasn't going to change no, it. No. And he also sort of has told friends that he reckoned that if he was going to get his hair cut, he wanted to get it cut in the, the Grafton Barber right, and, okay. and not in prison, you know. And when, having, he, when he walked out that door, like it, it was it was really unusual, wasn't it? Because like we were there, obviously, and all the reporters were there. And most people, I think, expected that he'd be in some way secreted out or maybe brought out the back door mm. or have some sort of arrangement. And it seemed really chaotic, didn't it? Considering what was at stake and all the attention, all the international media attention, do we know that he he had any plan there, or did it just sort of unfold as it unfolded? 
Well, that is what he has has told friends was exactly his plan. Yeah. That if he if he got off and he was found not guilty, he was walking out the front door as a free man. Yeah. And I suppose he's always valued his freedom in Dublin. Yeah. Hopping on and off a Lewis, hopping on and off a bus. People have always seen him walking up and down where we are on yeah. Talbot Street. He's regularly walking along with a friend, chatting. He's known to go out to local pubs to kind of have coffees in, you know, yeah. local places around here when he's when he's in the city. And I think that's what he valued and wanted to do. He wanted to walk out. Now, he probably would have been better hopping on the bloody Lewis, wouldn't probably, he? He probably would have been. Well, maybe not the Lewis, but he definitely, a bit more planning might have been but I mean, it was unique. Because, of course, to remind anybody who forgot, yeah. what happened was, of course, he was found not guilty. Um, he didn't show a huge amount of emotion, I don't no. think, in the courtroom. He met downstairs in the round room of the CCJ with his his solicitors. There was a taxi yeah. ordered for him at some point, whether that was on his phone or somebody else ordered it. As is typical of a Dublin taxi driver, uh, the call came, I'm outside. Yeah. So out walked Jerry Hutch, but the taxi driver was the far end yeah, of yeah, Phoenix yeah, Park. Yeah, exactly. I'll be there in two minutes was <laughs> didn't suit at this stage. And of course, then there was the, the famous moment where uh, his the guy who became known as, as his bodyguard uh, sort of appeared on the scene and sort of acted as his protector. And people obviously were thinking, who is this guy? Jerry doesn't look like their typical uh, security officer, let's put it that way. So that, that all added to the maybe the dramatic moment moment. Um, but if you think back to that that day, there was loads of articles, obviously he's found not guilty, but then there was loads of articles saying, as journalists always do, you, you give the verdict and then you have to predict what's next. And what was being predicted and what has happened, I suppose, in that year since he's walked out? So... What was being predicted was he was going to go into hiding, wasn't yeah, it? And, yeah. and, you know, oh, he was going to be running for his life and scared and all. And I think he showed the very opposite of that because instead he definitely stayed in Dublin yeah. for a period of time. And there was photographers employed for weeks on end to try and, gra- you know, grab snaps of him here, yeah. there and everywhere. The first picture of him without his beard or... The first for, picture yeah, of him without his beard these and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and, you know, he... Which we he went, published, so we're not looking yeah, down okay, on those yeah, we're pictures. Not, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not, not knocking them. Washed in the blood of the lamb here, no. but he um, he went home to his house in Clontarf and he had a party. Yeah, and his neighbours were invited, and then there was a big, huge blow up because some. Yeah, not to get into all that, but then there was somebody from the ombudsman from, or something. Yeah, had, the, there was a GSOC officer a GSOC. arrived at the. But yeah, yeah, no, so it was a it that was, blew up and blew down again as quick, didn't it? That well, was, it did, but I mean, it was one of those uh, gubu events, as I yeah. suppose you know, as as happened in Ireland, where these unbelievable events yeah. seem to occur around big stories. But yeah, it did. It it's it sort of there was a resignation and 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 things have moved on. But he did. He he stayed in Clontarf, I suppose, quite visibly um, mm. in, the, in the immediate aftermath. I think most people expected that he would go to Spain where where he has spent a lot of time in mm. recent years. He did obviously ultimately head off to Spain. He did, but I don't think he went too quick. I think he hung around for a period of time that maybe even the media got bored of him hanging yeah. around. I mean, I remember you and I saw him going down Tob Street yeah, one day, yeah, yeah. you know, shooting the breeze with some fella yeah. and he was just wandering along and, um, you know, he was spotted here, there and everywhere. There was a period of time, I think, when members of the public were sort of seeing him and kind of yeah. contacting you and, oh, I saw him. Yeah. I said, okay, well, yeah. Yeah, well he's, a, he's a free man. He's, But I suppose I was interested to know kind of and, and, and to find out as much as I possibly can what was going on really because that was the public, yeah. Jerry Hutch, who was you know, holding his head up, I suppose, going back into the, yeah. his community because he would always sort of say to friends as well, he moved to Clontarf years ago and reared his family there, but he is a North Inner City man yeah. at his heart and that's his community and that's where he feels most at home and he's in Ireland. But I think what was going on personally or what he certainly sort of, you know, told people is that he just sort of kicked back and he, he was almost like... Look, I'd say the man was almost slightly traumatised, a bit of post-traumatic yep. stress disorder from what you're facing yeah. in that moment. You know, you've got, it's like a ball going around a roulette machine. It's going to land on black or red. Yeah. You're either going to be put away for the rest of your life and probably die in prison, never see your family 
it's sort of in the same way again. They can come visit you, but there's going to be a screen dividing them and whatever else. Or you're going to feel freedom like you've never felt before. Yeah. And that, I think, is what happened. And I think for the first six months, he seems to have really enjoyed that freedom. And the simple things, hopping on a bus, getting off a bus, looking around, you know, going for a walk, enjoying a pint. He... um Friends would say that he let himself enjoy everything he wanted. Yeah. And he had in prison because I suppose he wasn't living that lifestyle that other inmates were. What he could enjoy in prison was whatever food he wanted. So he would be yeah. usually very kind of fit and conscious of that. And I think he put on a little bit of a little bit of weight and he continued over the six months to maybe concentrate on just having an ice cream when he wanted an ice cream, having a pint not, he, when he wanted it. Of course, the nickname The Monk comes back to the Veronica Gearing days, doesn't mm. it? Where he was described as, uh, as opposed to his contemporaries, he was lived like a monk. He didn't drink or smoke or take drugs. And of course, that's always been less true than people think, hasn't it? Like he does. Well, he certainly takes a point. I've no yeah. idea. I don't think he smokes yeah. or certainly doesn't nowadays. Yeah. And I'm not sure about the drugs thing. No. I, I I certainly don't think... Um, no, he's not. He's, he's, an, not a, he's an addict. Yeah. He certainly has no, no sort of addiction issues with, with drugs. Um, but um, I think he did that sort of for the first six months and 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 really enjoyed Christmas, really yeah. enjoyed the simple things again of Christmas, probably sitting with your family and having a meal. And um, but I mean, also carrying all that grief and yep. trauma that went with the last yep. decade of his life, which has included the murder of his brother, who he was very close to, Eddie Hutch, in the days after the Regency Hotel. And um, I think he was very close yeah. to, to Eddie. I don't know about the other brothers or how... No, I think he was close to them all. I mean, his his other brother, John, uh, Johnny Hutch, died. Um, nothing, he, not a, not a murder, he died. He fell fell down the stairs, I think, mm. and died as a, in a tragic accident. And obviously then, Jerry Hutch has also lost his nephews, um, Gary Hutch, uh, Garrett Hutch, yeah. and Derek Coakley That's Hutch. Three nephews. So he's also and lost... two friends. And two friends. Noel Duggan and um, Noel Kerwin. Yeah. So, I mean, he has all of that around him. Um, you know, that, that, that grief and that, mm. you know. And also, of course, then, um, do you think then that that has made him feel security conscious? Do you think that he is... is do, does he feel that that risks to him being killed or other members of his family has, has gone or... I don't know. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't know. I'm sure he doesn't. Yeah. I'm sure he certainly has got used to living looking, you know, over his shoulder all the time and he's probably, probably, probably a lot of them should. Yeah. If they haven't, they should get used to that. Um, they probably have in fairness. Yeah. I mean, they've had years of it and um, definitely, look, the threat has abated. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. The threat level here in Dublin over a number of times over the, certainly in the first two years after the Regency was deemed a critical threat level. And that's the same threat level that would be in place if there was a terrorist risk. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, that is as high as it gets. So that has been in place in Dublin. But of course, we don't know much about where Jerry Hutch went in those years because he wasn't back here in Dublin. If he was, he was probably staying in the north inner city in yeah. homes where he felt safe. I don't know, was he back in the country? He certainly went off the radar for a long time. It appears he was travelling and he was lying low. Yeah. Um. So, you know, that was a long time that he was doing that. And of course, when he was arrested, he was with his wife, I think, wasn't yeah. he? In, yeah. in Spain. And they had come from Lanzarote, which is where he has had his home before and after all of this has happened. I mean, Lanzarote appears to be a place where he feels very safe. He's lived there a long time. And I wonder, is it one of those places that, you know, when you become so familiar with something, you can feel and hear and see things coming because they look out of place. Yeah. Even though it's a tourist island and I'm sure there's an awful lot of strangers' faces on the island a lot of the time in the summer and that. Um, I mean, Jerry Hutch, remember, survived an assassination attempt 
he believes anyway, and he has told friends and named the two individuals who yep. he says came from in Lanzarote the New Year's Eve after his nephew Gary Hutch was killed in Spain. And one of the two that he has named, of course, is Cumberton, yep. who was um He's ser- yeah, he's certainly serving a, a life sentence for the murder of... What's his first name again? Eamon Cumberton. Eamon Cumberton. Yeah. He's serving a life sentence for the murder of Michael Barr in yes. the Sunset House. I think he wore a Freddy Krueger mask when, mask when he went into that pub and shot him dead. He was working as a barman, Michael Barr, in front of customers, including a, a local um, chap who had special needs and was totally traumatised, and as was everybody else yeah. in the pub, for God's sake. Um, so he... Is wily, you know what I mean? I mean, that night, from what I can piece together on New Year's Eve in Lanzarote, he was out in a pub um, that he would go to. He was with members of his family, I believe. And he would have told people in the aftermath of that, that he got a phone call from somebody from a sort of, they got a phone call maybe from somebody from the north inner city looking to meet up, which was unusual slightly. Uh, It was an individual they knew, but they wouldn't necessarily have socialised with this person. This person was very, seemed very anxious to uh, meet up with them. And um, so that kind of raised his heckles in the light of what was happening at that stage. And as he was standing in the pub, he's told people he saw these two familiar faces come in yeah. from the north inner city. Yeah, because Eamon Cumberton would have been uh, from the north inner city and would yeah. have had associates. And as was the other individual yeah. that he's named. But um, they, he saw them come in and he just in a split second made a decision to exit at yeah. the back of the, that, that pub. And, you know, he is fully convinced they came to kill him and yeah. that Daniel Kinahan sent them to kill him. And in a way... That changed everything, didn't it? It did. It did. Um, I mean, that 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 it certainly, certainly changed everything for the Hutch organization. I think that's when really that plan went into place. Yeah, I think there was a realization that it wasn't going to stop at from the Hutches believed at least that it yeah. wasn't going to stop at Gary and that mm. the murder of Gary Hutch didn't settle things. That it was going to continue to go. Um, and because you see, I think Jerry Hutch is is that old school criminal gangland type character that would live by certain rules. Mm. Um, They don't live by the law. No. Right? But they live by a certain code and that old code would have been that, you know, if somebody rats or if they steal money, there are consequences. Yeah. And no matter who that person is, there's consequences. So these accusations had been levelled against Gary Hutch. Um, I think, you know, it's fair to say that the monk was brought uh, to bring together Daniel Kinahan and Gary Hutch to try and talk yeah. with each other. Whether he remained for those negotiations or hammered out the deal is questionable. He has told people he didn't. He just was the kind of the go-between yeah. that they came together to meet. Um, he has told people that Gary Hutch and Daniel Kinahan appeared to have this very deep friendship, that they lived together, they, you know would have movie nights on a Saturday yeah. together in their gymmers, you know, having yeah. a cup of tea or whatever, they their beers or whatever. Um, they really got on really well. And when they fell out, it was it was almost like a divorce nearly. Yeah. That they were kind of, certainly Daniel Kinahan appears to have been upset about it at times. Yeah. He believed, Daniel Kinahan believed that Gary Hutch tried to kill him. Yeah. That was the night that Jamie Moore was shot in his um, garden. He firmly believed at that point that Gary Hutch had come to kill him. And I think that Jerry Hutch's sort of old school thought process on that is, well, if somebody comes to kill you, can you ever trust them again? Yeah. If you really genuinely believe that somebody has come and they've tried to kill you, even if they apologise, can... Can you, can you just trust move on? them or yeah. how do you move on from that? So I don't I, I don't know how he how he felt but about it, but did he think that there was ever going to be peace after that? I don't know. I certainly don't think he expected them to come for him. No, and I think as well he was probably dragged into it as to, to give a sort of uh, uh, a status to the Hutch negotiations. Yeah. Just the fact that he was maybe one step removed from some of those negotiations, but he was brought in there as a as a figure and of respect. an older of head, really, yeah. you know, as well. A figure of respect. I mean, he would insist, Jerry Hutch would insist that he does not know Christy Kinahan Senior. I mean, that all that story was told 
a yeah. number of different ways, never very far removed from each other. But at times it was said that the monk and Christy Sr. got together yeah. and hammered out a negotiation. The monk would insist that he never no. met with Christy Sr., that he only ever met with Christy Sr. at one point years ago when he was in his 20s and Sr. was in his brother Eddie's house because, yeah. of course, Sr. and Eddie were... But they were definitely they, pals. They were definitely, certainly they worked together. Yeah. And Christopher Sr., Christopher Kinahan Sr., you know, in the early part of his criminal career, he would have kind of got these sort of checks out of um, uh, Eddie Hutch, you know, what would you call them? Those those travellers checks, and travellers and checks, things and stuff. like that. And he would have, with his kind of fine manners and his, you know, his his posh accent, I suppose, gone and got them cashed. He would have done deals if something was up for offer, had been stolen down the docks or wherever it was stolen, couches, whatever it was. He would have gone and done some negotiations to sell them on. And of course, like a his, fence, yeah, Eddie's Eddie's son. Uh, Bouncer Hutch as well would have been very close to the, to Daniel Kinnahan and, and Christy Kinnahan's sons and would have spent time over in Spain with, with Christy Kinnahan Sr. as well. So that was definitely a, a big connection. But That was definitely the connection. But, you know, look, I think he's always insisted, Jerry Hutch, that he didn't meet with Christy Kinnahan, that he did meet with Daniel Kinnahan and, you know, spoke to him, I think spoke to Gary and then left them yeah. to sort of come to a con- come work to a, it out. Yeah. Um, so, I suppose a role of a mediator in that, and he certainly didn't expect them to come for him, but they did. So, yes, anyway, I think he sort of enjoyed himself for six months. And maybe when any of us are relaxing and coming down off a, a big high or a big, you know, trauma, yeah, we will tend to do that. And I think of more, more recently, people who have seen him said that he's very much trimmed down Um He's obviously gone back into a fitness program. He's right. maybe not allowing himself the ice cream every time he no. wants one, uh, but is still traveling in and out of the country and basing himself in Lanzarote. I don't know what he's doing. Yeah, he's, he's like he has he has enough money to to live that lifestyle. I mean, clearly, it, clearly he does. Mm. I mean, he has he's enough. He doesn't have to get a part-time job at McDonald's no. to fund his, hot, to fund his, his no, no, no. trips to well, Lanzarote. Well past all that. I mean... Well, how, much, how wealthy he is or not is is always a, a matter of debate, isn't it? It is. Um, and what about, do, do, do these friends of his today think that his legal uh, issues are at an end? Do, does, he, does he live in fear of the police calling to his door again and maybe... Can, you know, there, there's all, there was a lot of talk about investigations into the Hutch Organised mm. Crime Group and any charges that, that could be brought as a result of that. Certainly um, the, the role of John Spud Murphy, the corrupt ex-Garda, yeah. that has been discussed in relation to the Hutch, the Hutch gang. Do you, do you think that that is... I don't know how... Um, I don't know what you talk about that yeah. to people yeah. at that end of it, but I'm sure given the fact that he was you know, put on charges of murder. You'd have to be left wary that they would come, for, you know, the state would come after you yeah. again if they had yeah. a case against you. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I mean, would you be coming in and out of the country so frequently? I don't... I don't know. I mean, these these cases, look, I think they're, they're going to be complicated. Any of those, I suppose, investigations into the operations of organised crime groups, you're not going to find people, you know, sitting in the same rooms as, as say, a load of a load of drugs, for example, or a load of guns. So they tend to be complicated um, and involve digital communications and things like that. Um, so whether, I don't think it's it's mysterious to everybody really sometimes as mm. these investigations go on, what, what's going to be there and it's never going to be a straightforward. I would have to say, I think probably Hutch along with the rest of us is more focused on what's going to happen next with the Kinnahans. Yeah. You know, there is this sense of anticipation all the time, isn't there? And I think anyone you speak to, be they in the criminal fraternity or, you know, members more of the public, legal, yeah. oh. uh, sort of people working in law enforcement, they're all sort of anxiously waiting to see what happens next. And I think there is this sort of universal acceptance that it's going to happen quick. Yeah. Something's going to happen and it's going to happen quick. None of us know the time or date except those in the yep. very top of the pile and in charge. But I think you'd be very focused on that. And, you know, I often wonder how does somebody like Jerry Hutch feel, somebody like his brother Patsy Hutch feel? I know the family blame 
Johnny Hutch's death, be it accidental, yeah. on the Kinnahans as well. Yeah. And the stress he was under since he was, he survived an assassination attempt with his his daughter in yeah. the car who he had collected from her care facility yeah. and had arrived back to the house. And I think his daughter remained in the car yeah. as he was shot at a number of times and just managed to dive into a house and close a bullet resistant back gate door thing, which saved his life. Um, he later was in Turkey and jumped from a balcony and suffered injuries because he believed somebody was coming for him in the, f- I mean, was there or wasn't there? Who who will ever know if there was yep. somebody coming for him or not? Whether there was or wasn't doesn't matter. He believed there was yes. and that was the way he was living. And that stress, I think the family feel that he is another victim yeah. as well of the Kinnahans, even though they didn't get him with a bullet. Yeah. So, um, you know, I often wonder, like, how do they cope with all those emotions you must have? I mean, you must have a anger. hatred yeah. and anger. Yeah. I mean, anybody whose loved one has been shot dead yeah. in cold blood by, and you know who, who did it. I mean, innocent victims yeah, and, you know, victims who are caught probably by choice operating in the criminal world. No matter what, they have people who've 100% suffered huge like, losses. Exactly. And exactly. How would you feel? I mean... Well, I mean, I wonder is, you know, exactly. I mean, this, this is what's driven this feud, I suppose, is that that anger on both both sides and that desire, I suppose, for maybe for revenge, but... There's very few feuds, I think, you can look back on that you've seen that sort of massacre of wider family and friends. 100%. I mean, even you're talking about Johnny Hutch there, even his own son, Jonathan Hutch, was, was again, was the initial target in while he was on holidays that ultimately ended in the death of an innocent council worker. That's right. And Gareth Hutch was yeah. murdered, his Gareth, other son. Is Gareth, exactly. So, I mean, it like the, the long-term consequences for all of this are absolutely, you know, it's, mm. it's, it's ongoing. I suppose, certainly for, for Jerry Hutch, the, that moment where the Kinnahans end up being arrested, I suppose, that must seem like a something that would maybe be another end point, whether it will or not, who knows. Yeah, who knows? I mean, I think somebody like him, because he's not a total innocent here we're no, talking about, no. the monk. I mean, I don't think he'd ever proclaim himself to be an innocent. But somebody like him understands the world he has operated in and around. He understands that if you do something, the repercussions could be murder. Yeah. And he understands that from every side. But I think what happened within the feud crossed that boundary. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, there were no rules as to who was being no, targeted. And, and I suppose to give the other side, the Kinnans would say that that some Kinnans, of the people yeah. would say, or the Kinnans would say that the, the Hutches launched the attack first on Daniel Kinnahan. Obviously, um, instead, the, Jamie Moore got shot, the boxing trainer yeah. in his in his apartment. They would say that some of the victims were, that we might describe as being totally innocent. They were not as, as you know, they... Kinnahan certainly identified a number of the victims as people they believed were involved in the Regency Hotel attack. And we did hear in the court and during the Regency trial, we were able to piece together exactly who the Gardaí also believe yeah. were involved. And yeah. certainly... Yeah, I mean, they, 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 there was there was movements of cars. Obviously, Eddie Hutch's name was mentioned during the Regency trial. Um, there was no... He was obviously dead, but, you know, from... So the Kinnahans have their... The Kinnahans believe certainly that Gareth Hutch, that Johnny Hutch and that Eddie Hutch were involved in the movement of cars, they were you. They were drivers or something yeah. during the the attack. Now those, certainly. yeah, and those things didn't get tested in court for the obvious no. reason that they and died. Those people aren't alive to yeah. defend themselves. But I'm just saying that's what the yeah. Kinnahans would say. They identified those people as. Yeah. And if you look back at the the book that they sponsored or wrote, the Kinnahans, the, mm. the online Blood book feud. Blood mm. Feud. So if you read that, like it's an interesting. Uh, piece of work, I suppose, in terms of what it what it says, but a lot of it is a justification mm. for the, the the basically not it's not to exaggerate it to call it the massacre of the Hutch family. And um, uh, there's a lot of a lot of that book is, you know, this 
is 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 around that is a description of why they were justified in doing what they did. There's a big long description of why they believe Gary Hutch was an informer. We don't know if that's true or not, but you know they had. So I suppose are we easy on Jerry Hutch? I mean, one of the start actually one of the things I remember from from one year ago mm. was when Jerry Hutch walked out and then in that week after yeah. this kind of goodwill oh, yes. towards yeah. him I mean an unusual thing maybe and maybe not I mean maybe there's been outlaws through human history that have sort of inspired that goodwill from the wild west in, in the US to you know guys in Australia like why does that attach to Jerry Hutch and is you know why does it not attach to Christy Kinnan I know there's an obvious reason for that I think there's a few reasons that maybe Jerry Hutch had, I mean, there was certainly a sense when he walked out that day and in the aftermath of it, I mean, we said it a number of times, like as if he was loved. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was people be- beeping their car yeah. uh, horns at him. They were up Jerry. There was all sorts of um, social media postings and, and all this. And certainly there was this feeling that he'd beaten the system. Yeah. And I think that's the first thing that he had this reputation, always had a reputation. Now, maybe it was a self-made reputation. Yeah. You know, he might have pushed it himself. Yeah. And there could have been a bit of propaganda going on from the Hutch side over the years as well, that he was this sort of Robin Hood figure. Yeah. He was Robin, uh, you know, banks and and this sort of thing. And he was really just clawing his way up yeah. from the poverty that he yeah. had. An ordinary been born decent into. criminal. An ordinary course. decent criminal he was yeah. certainly seen as, right? There's that. Second of all, I think that he has an ability to walk amongst the people. Yeah. He's not kind of like the Kinnahans did everything wrong from a PR point yeah. of view in a way. Even when the younger Kinnahans, the, the two brothers returned to the city, they did so in these kind of blacked out cars and surrounded by sort of thugs yeah. who were kind of warning people away from yeah. them and all this as if they were kind of like yeah. Conor McGregor or, or some yeah. sort of celebrities. And they didn't have the ability or feel they had the ability or, or maybe they didn't have the personality yeah. to walk around in the same way that Jerry Hutch has. And I think that made him kind of a little bit more um, personable maybe to yeah. people. Um, I think the fact as well, maybe he's a family man uh, is something that warms people to him a little bit. And really, his name isn't thrown in there. Every hand's turn, there's a murder. No, no. So, so, do you know, Jerry Hutch's name and the Hutch organisation name might be put out a lot about robberies and, you know, and about some serious crime. I mean, Gary Hutch was right up there yeah. as a main player in the Kinahan organisation. You know, let's be clear about it. Jerry Hutch might have built his reputation on being anti-drugs, but the next generation, J- Gary Hutch is named in Operation Shovel Files in 2010 as being a lieutenant directly under Daniel Kinahan. So that, that Hutch organisation has certainly become a drugs organisation by then. Um, the rest of it, as regards the popularity and all the rest of it, I think he's a marketing department's dream. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what it's a, what it is. What if he mm. could bottle what he has and sell it? Because it is a big. It, it's really rare for somebody who is known and maybe famous or infamous as an you know an organized criminal. criminal to be popular. It is, it is very rare, but not unheard of. I mean, it has happened throughout human history, like. Mm. Robin Hood, of course, is that the mm. you know, criminals always get described as as Robin Hood. But I mean, it happened in the, the Wild West in America where these outlaws became also became kind of celebrities and, and cultural icons. I mean, I can see um, from the perspective of the other side how fus- annoying and um, annoying is probably a bad word for it, how, uh, how it makes them very, very angry yeah. that Jerry Hutch receives this treatment. Mm. I mean, in the judgment, in the special criminal court, he is described as the patriarch of the Hutch organised crime group. Um, the, the, in their summation, the judges describe Jerry Hutch as having at least knowledge of the movement of these weapons and control of these mm-hmm. weapons. Um, so it is, uh, you can see it from their perspective as yeah. well, how, how you know, that must be... Irritating. Irritating to say the least. Well, especially for the likes of Daniel Kinnan, who's yeah. tried so hard for people to like him. Yeah. I mean, he has tried his damnedest. Yeah. He surrounded himself with uh, certainly people who have spoken up from largely from the boxing community. Yeah. Who have 
you know, gone out there and done interviews with the media to tell everybody what a great guy. Yeah, Daniel I mean, Kinnahan famously, is. Uh, Sandra Vaughan, I think, who was his, the ex uh, head of MTK Global, um, a, a Scottish businesswoman, saying how Ireland should be proud of Daniel Kinnan. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that oh, quote yes. in particular. So, I mean, he's made an active effort. He's made an active effort to be liked. Yeah. And I think, actually, funny enough, when you talk to people who know him and who are, I suppose, within his circle. inner circle, um, they talk about a person who changed, a person who, when he was in Dublin, when he was in Oliver Bond, was, you know, what they'd call a great guy. He was yeah. good fun. He was a little bit aloof, but not totally. But I think as he grew up, came of age, moved out to Spain, took over his father's empire, he got this sort of aloofness that, well, it's, look, I mean, the guy is clearly a narcissist, yeah. his own father. Yeah. And he believes himself to be on an upper plane to others. And I think he he can't understand yeah. why people don't like him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and look, that's it's it's a it's a funny thing to discuss, is it really? I suppose public image when you're coming to organize criminals. Sure. I mean it's it's a it's a unusual uh but that's the way it is. I mean, we live in the real world and, and even the, f- the feud itself has been fought on uh, on uh, in regards to popularity yeah. over social media and all. Like that is the unusual thing about mm. this feud. That There was also that sub feud in, in a popularity battle, I suppose. I mean, if you talk to, uh, you know, older Gardaí, maybe retired now, it's all you know, they're scumbags and, yeah. you know, they're not. But the public perceive things differently, particularly in this, in the modern world where the trust in the Gardaí and maybe the trust in journalists, they're all decreasing. Yeah. And therefore these people, you know, people... Well, they have, have a voice themselves now. They have a voice themselves. They have an ability to create their own narrative and the money to because they have plenty of uh, people who have been yeah. paid to put out their social media postings. One thing I do think is worthwhile pointing out, although maybe obvious. I don't think Jerry Hutch's popularity with a popularity as a criminal with yeah. the people of Ireland, let's be, you know, yeah. he's not he's not um, you know, a guy who yeah. invented a machine to no. help us all live better lives, but his popularity as a criminal, you know, weighing that up with others' popularities yeah. as criminals. I don't think that had anything to do with the decision that was made by the Special no. Criminal no. Court. I think that decision went down to the lack of evidence against him. Yeah. End of. Yeah, and you could argue, and I think it's a very, and we've said it before, I mean, he was brought on a murder charge. The bar for for convicting somebody of murder is, you know, they must be proven to be guilty beyond reasonable doubt. The case that was brought, there is no, there's, it's very hard to look at it and not to say there wasn't reasonable doubts there. And um, the evidence was not so conclusive, so overwhelming, which it has to be to get a mm-hmm. murder conviction that he, he he had to be convicted. Um, and you'd have to look at it and think other charges could have been brought. We've seen other charges regarding conspiracy and facilitation, but they were not before the judges in the special criminal court it was a straight up murder charge and you know it's impossible to have sat through that and said for example Jonathan Dowdle's evidence should have been taken uh, you know without without uh, you know, doubts. Yeah. No, it ju- you just couldn't, mm. as a reasonable person, mm. say, I don't, I have no doubt he's telling the truth. I think the other thing about Hutch that I've been told, um, and by people who are close enough to him, I think that they would know this, that he's this great believer in karma. Yeah. You know, in this sort of spiritual karma. Maybe that's all you can do if, yeah. if you've gone through what he has. Um, but it's that belief that karma will come to yeah. Daniel Kinahan and is coming. Yeah. And, you know, you'd wonder, would members of the Hutch organization, if they knew that Daniel Kinahan was going to be in such and such a pub tonight, would they go in and kill him? I think they would. You think they would? I do. Um, yeah. I, I mean, think I think if they had an opportunity, I don't think they have had an opportunity because he's so far away and safely tucked up in Dubai with all the, you know, the people that he has around him and he's deep into the social and the political life out there and he has his protections. But, you know, if he came home to Dublin and he was in a pub tonight, do you seriously think that they wouldn't you well, know, I, go back maybe to their, 
you know, are they going to rely on the system? They have to rely on the system. And maybe that's why you have to believe karma will catch up with them. Well, I wonder, would they turn up in court if if we get a day in court in the special criminal court? Will members, members of the Hutch family? Because of course, Daniel is in theory, um, he, the, the guards are hoping to prosecute him for the murder of Eddie Hutch. Oh, I think they'll show up in their droves. So, so of course, and normally when... Surprised so, if they stayed away from that. Yeah, so I mean, that's what you could face. Whatever about gangland charges, but if he was if he was on trial for the murder of Eddie Hutch, mm. would Jerry Hutch be sitting there in the special criminal court looking him in the eye? And you know that would be that would be a moment I have to say. Mm. Um, well, I can recall when the the murder trials relating to Gareth Hutch's murder was happening, and that was a very sort of tense time. Yeah. Um. His family were there. His family were there. But they not were there every day. Yeah, his sisters and yeah and yeah. So look, that would be a moment, and of course, it'd be another incredible moment. Are we going to be sitting here in a few years and watching Daniel Kinahan walk out of the front of the special criminal court after being found not guilty? Will Is that be, even? <laughs> will he be beeped at? And uh, you know, I don't know. Will I be trying to find out how he coped at, in the aftermath of it? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. Look, on we go. I mean, we're 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 sort of in this slight little no man's land. There's a little bit of calm now, but I just feel exactly yeah. that. I think it's going to kick off again. I think there's going to be movement in Dubai. Yeah, look, I mean, the guards are over there. And mm. if they would not be over there for this extended period of time with all these contacts, if there was a no hope or little hope. So I think they... And it'll be political as well. I mean, look, you know, won't it be political? You know, it's going to be something that the, the this government are going to want to oversee. Yeah, I mean, even straight away, Simon Harris is uh, elected new Taoiseach and the Kinnons are... He's already speaking about them, you know. Mm. So it, something will happen, I, I do believe. And I don't think it's going to be... And Helen McEntee really has been there and at the head, neck and tail of it as Justice Minister. And she remains Justice Minister. And I think she will want to yeah. see it out as well. Yeah. Um, and of course, Drew Harris was out there speaking at the World Policing Conference or something. And he's quite... Yeah, it about the Kinnahans. Yeah, I think they're definitely definitely for the government. It's become a thing. <laughs> Actually, there's some uh, internet uh, conspiracy theorists or otherwise who say every every time things are going wrong for the government, they start t- speaking about bringing the Kinnahans to justice. Right. And there, it has become a thing of uh, a thing that they feel comfortable saying, and they know there's a certain amount of publicity that goes with it. They're not being cynical about it. I am being cynical about it. Mm-hmm. I fully believe that they're absolutely committed to bringing them home as well. But I, I don't think we'll we'll see at the end of 2024 without something happening. I wonder, will Jerry Hutch celebrate today? Is it a day? Well, you know, it, it, a year, an anniversary of the day he walked free. It would have to be. You know, put yourself in his shoes for a minute. It would have to be well, it's the most a significant thing that had probably it's happened a, in your life. Yeah, it's a sliding doors moment, as they say. And we can say it's obvious now he was going to be found not guilty. Yeah. But when you're sitting there in the courts, it's always a lottery. Mm. And I have seen cases that I thought there's no way I'd say if I was on the jury, I'd say guilty. Mm. And they've come back guilty. So, yeah, it's 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 been an interesting year, but yeah. I think it'll get even more interesting before. I think it was certainly will. The next year will will prove. Maybe we'll be looking at the other side of um, this famous saga. Saga. Okay. Thanks, Noel. Thanks, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel. And turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.